So we've been journeying through the Bible this year, and so we are up to kind of the latter part of Isaiah. And, and last week we heard from the beginning about God's faithfulness in Isaiah's life. And Isaiah, when, when asked upon, about who God should call, Isaiah steps forward and says, send me, here I am. He doesn't say to the, you know, send someone else, send someone who's better positioned or knows more than me. He says, send me. And so in our readings, we find ourselves again at the latter part of Isaiah. And today we're going to kind of bounce around with just a few verses. Uh, but the sermon title today is Hitting the Target. One day a man went into the woods to go hunting. And so as he rounded a corner, he unexpectedly encountered a bear. And as quickly as possible, he aimed his rifle and took a shot, but he missed. Immediately the bear came charging toward him, and out of extreme fear, the man froze, and he couldn't move. But he was able to, to muster up a few brief words in a prayer, and he said, O oh Lord, please forgive me for not living for you, and grant me one petition. Please make a Christian out of this bear that is coming after me. That very second... The bear skidded to a halt in front of the man, fell onto his knees, clasped its paws together, and began to pray, Dear God, bless this food I am about to receive. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard that story or joke before, but it's in, it, it teaches us an important lesson here, that it is not a good thing to miss what you are aiming to shoot whether you're aiming at a bear or whether you're aiming at a target in an archery competition. In fact, we, we had the joy of going to the stockade, Forest City Stockade yesterday, and watching people shoot at targets with rifles and with, uh, with arrows. It was, it was a lot of fun to watch. But missing results can cause severe penalties or consequences. And so today, my focus is really going to be on a simplify back down, bring us back to how these consequences can show up and how important it is that we don't miss the mark when it comes to our relationship with God. How it happens and what are those resulting consequences should we miss the mark. And so we also learn how to live our lives centered and on target with who God is. So my sermon in a sentence and I know that there's a handful of you that have not been here before, so I'll just explain. This is my summary statement for the message, so that when you leave today, if you remember nothing else other than this, this can be a way to share with someone you come into contact what you learned or what was talked about on Sunday. So sin is when we miss the mark, thus causing separation between us and God. And we can only be reconciled through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so the first thing that we learn, and I'm going to bounce around, I said already in Isaiah a little bit this morning, more maybe than normal. But we learn first that we are all born off, topic, or off target with God. Let's say that again. We are all born off target with God. We are all broke, or we are all, we all enter the world in sin. None of us falls after we've begun our life. We enter this life in a sinful state. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Isaiah here is plainly stating that it is our sin that separates us from God. And as they are, all of our kids that were here for CEF aren't here anymore, but they talked about this idea that when you have sin, you were once close, but sin has separated us from our Maker. Now, one commentator named John Gill says that the imagery that Isaiah uses here is like imagining a partition wall that divides the people. And it divides them 
from God. I've seen it. Maybe you've seen the drawing where uh, it's God and us, and then sin creates kind of like a valley or a mountain or a, a huge valley of space that man cannot cross on its own. So whatever analogy you like, understand that it is a partition that we cannot cross. We cannot have this communion with God. God does not grant his he does not grant his gracious presence to them who live in sin, but stands at a distance. Our sin separates us from a God who is holy and righteous. And as sinful humans, we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. It's kind of like imagining sin is like oil and holiness is like pure water. And we know how well oil and water mix. Now the distance between God and humanity in this fallen state is extremely wide. It's like launching an arrow towards the target and being way, and you end up way in the woods because you missed it high and wide. And this accuracy is essential. Sin eliminates our accuracy in the game of life and leaves us off target in what we have in our relationship with God. And the biblical truth is this, we cannot miss this, that again, people were born into sin and we begin by nature off target from God. Paul said in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, though one man's sin entered the world, or through one man one sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death was spread to all men, because all sin. And he also stated earlier in Romans chapter 3 that there is none who are righteous, not even one. Another verse that's very familiar to us, and that's in Romans chapter 3, verses 23, we read that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, when Paul wrote this, he uses the word, and I'm going to follow this if I butcher this word, but the word I believe is pronounced harmatano, harma, harma which comes from the Greek word, or the root word, hamartia. That's my best effort at trying to get that, <laughs> my English, English heritage. So, um, But this book, this word, first appeared about 400, roughly 400 years before Paul wrote it, and we, and we see it first used by Aristotle in a poetic book back in 335 B.C. And the notion here with which it was foundationally used is that it means that we have missed the mark, that something has missed the mark. It, it indicates, in archery term, it means missing the bullseye. We have missed the mark. So, for example... I imagine that when these gentlemen who were shooting the arrows yesterday were practicing, they were trying to hone their skills leading up, there might be someone who could be by kind of keeping track of how they're doing, maybe some kind of a scorekeeper. You would certainly see this in a competition. Now, if the soldier or the, or the person yesterday, in either case, missed the bullseye, in the, the scorekeeper would yell out, Hamarsha! And it eventually found its way, it was so commonly that it eventually found its way into the language of the New Testament. And it ultimately here means it's making the point of helping us understand we have missed the mark with God. Now John MacArthur elaborates saying that this word originally carries the idea of missing the mark with a bow and an arrow, as I've already said. But it eventually became important that it meant that we were missing or falling short of a goal or some standard or some purpose. In the spiritual realm, it refers to missing or falling short of God's standards, of his holiness, and in the New Testament, the most common and general form or term for sin. Now sin, as I've already said, is simply missing the mark with God. You've maybe heard alternative definitions, and those are fine, but at its core, sin means we have fallen short or missed the mark. I said this to someone last week, that 
one word, if I, if I was asked to explain what's the foundation underneath all of our sins, and I couldn't use the word sin, I think the word I would pick is distrust. And I don't mean distrust of one another, I mean distrust of God's word. That when we sin, ultimately underneath, if we could peel back all of the layers, all of the excuses that we use, underneath it all, we have distrusted what God had to say about whatever is at the core of that sin. And so we fall short because we trust ourselves too much and we distrust God too easily. Now, has anyone in here actually participated in an archery competition before? Anybody that could teach us some lessons? No? So, if, so when, you, when you do that, when you participate in an archery tournament uh, and you miss the marks, there are penalties added to your score, which are not obviously a good thing. And so an obvious question might be, what is the penalty for falling short of God's standard of holiness? And we see it, we saw it in the cover of the bulletin, I believe, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin, the cost, the penalty for sin is death. This is a reference to spiritual death, which is eternal separation from God's presence. An enduring, infinite death. An eternal separation from God. And never-ending punishment in the flames of hell. The penalty for missing the mark with God is death. So maybe a interesting, maybe a question you might not think of, but I thought of it as I was going through this. Was there ever such a penalty like this, some sort of equivalent, if you will, um, in the in actual archery competition? And so, not surprising that there was to a degree, not eternal death, but during the 6th century in Japan, the samurai practiced mounted archery in a game they called, again, I'm going to just pronounce this the best I can, Yabusami. The penalty for missing was an added incentive for them to hit the target. Because the warriors who missed their target were obliged to take their own lives. Now, today's society, let's move forward quite a bit of time here, and, and we recognize today's society is what we would call post-modernism, maybe even beyond that I've heard post-postmodern. But what I'm getting at here is there is, there is really no sense of belief in any absolute truth. And there's no absolute standards for anything. That's largely the game that people, or the, the rules that people are playing by. We have to understand that. And unfortunately, that creeps in in places in some, even some of our churches where these standards, the standard of God's word, the unchanging standards are being manipulated in some places. We live in a day where it's the philosophy, the basic life that we want to live is about doing what feels good. And that it's perfectly fine to just experiment with different lifestyle choices and not think twice about it, as long as it feels good to you. If, in, in my analogy with the arrows, it's as though we've said, forget about the target, just take your bow and arrow and just start shooting aimlessly any direction you so feel. And wherever it ends up, that's the target that you are supposed to go for. There is no absolute center. You're left to just kind of uh, blow in the wind, as Scripture says. But we need to remember that when we don't hit the center, there is a price to pay. And that penalty, as we've just read, is your life. Now, Eric Hovind, whose dad was a creation science evangelist, uh, he said, today I participated in my first archery competition. The target was steel buck, literally a steel buck silhouette, and a 4x4 four four inch square cut away where they could hit and kill the deer. If you miss the square, you never get to shoot that arrow again, because it hits the steel buck, 
and just destroys the arrow. Now he experienced his first miss in his second round shooting from 35 yards away. And his words, he says, ouch, when you hear your own arrow hit the steel and you realize you have missed the mark, your stomach sinks, your heartbeat escalates, and you feel more pressure in the next shot. He goes on to, ex to describe how his stomach sank when he missed the target and how he escalated, it escalated his actual physiology in his body. Now, I've never shot a bow and arrow, and I've probably only shot a gun, I think, once. But for those of you that have experience doing so, imagine doing so now when, oh, you miss, now you have to hit it. Your anxiety, you maybe start to shake a little bit. You're, you know, imagine doing anything when your anxiety goes up. It's pretty difficult, isn't it? But he says, this is the same sensation we experience whenever we do something we know is wrong. If so, this experience this sensation you are experiencing is the conviction of the Holy Spirit in us. Now, someone a few weeks ago said to me, they said, Aaron, I did this, and I'm, I'm feeling bad about the choice that I made. And I said, you know what? The worst thing that would happen would be if you didn't feel that conviction. If that conviction was gone, if you had given yourself up so that the Holy Spirit was not welcome into your life, because we all make mistakes, we need that gentle and sometimes maybe not so gentle reminder of the Spirit in us. So we have to be careful not to quench the Spirit in our lives. But it's through that conviction that, of the Spirit that we are able to be realigned with God's purposes before it's too late. Secondly, we cannot hit the target by ourselves. In Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 7, we read, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is no one who calls, us, who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Now in verse 6, we read that we are all unclean. Even the righteousness that we think we have in us is described as filthy rags. John Gill again says, They are rags not whole, but imperfect, not fit to appear before God, and by which they cannot be justified. They are filthy ones, being attended with imperfection and sin. Now there are countless people who are trying to hit the target by themselves, attempting to work their way into heaven through their righteous acts and deeds. It's one of the most prominent belief, false beliefs in our world today. It is by what we do that we are saved. That is the mantra in many places and in any many minds. But very clearly Isaiah states it is not our good works because those works are seen only like dirty rags in the eyes of the Lord. If we are left to, if I am, I'll personalize this, if I was left to my own devices, I would remain unholy and unworthy to come into God's presence. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul wrote, For it is by grace that you have been saved, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And according to what we read in Isaiah, all of our good works will fade into nothingness. We will remain trapped in our sins and in our iniquities, and they will carry us away until we crumble into tiny pieces like a leaf. Now later on, Peter quotes Isaiah chapter 40, and he, he says this, he says, All of our flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. So one day, we, pass, one day we will pass away, each one of us, and we will stand before God in judgment. And all of 
of our righteous acts, if it is our righteousness with which we think we're going to stand before God and somehow win his approval, we'll find ourselves grievously disappointed. Because God's standard is perfection. And therefore, when we try to do this on our own and on our works, we will fall short. Now, here, in, in our way of looking at heaven and, and the way we want to do things, we may even try to develop our own standard of righteousness. Sometimes it happens, well, at least I might be like the Pharisees. Well, at least, thank you, God, for not making me like that guy over there, that sinner over there. At least I'm better than so-and-so, and that becomes maybe our foundation to feel better about ourselves. But it can also show up in ways as this example might tend to portray. So imagine that you told someone, I'm going to bet you $100 that I could hit that target 50 yards away. So you draw your bow, you shoot your arrow, and off goes the arrow, and lands in a tree. And so then you walk over there, and the man is asking you for $100 because you missed the target, and you go over and you take a marker, and you draw around your, your target, or your, I'm sorry, your arrow, oh, look, I hit the target. He's determining his own standard for what it is to hit the target there. So he's now saying, no, you, in fact, you owe me $100 because I hit my target. That's, in a sense, a visual of what it would look like for us to try to draw our own standards. Well, I don't meet God's standard of perfection, but hey, at least I meet these things that seem right in my mind, so as long as this is the rules that I'm playing by, that's all that really matters to me. As I've already said, I want to emphasize this again. We are really prone to justify our behaviors and our standards based on what we see in others. And the reality is we don't know what led them to where they are. But we, we tend to look at others and we see faults in others that we have the same faults or maybe even worse faults that we ignore. That's the log and the speck at work right there. And so we use that. Why? Because it makes us feel good. We feel better about ourselves and about the choices we made because, hey, you know what? At least I didn't do that. We need to judge ourselves against an absolute standard of good. The mark or the target that Scripture refers to is very plain. And anything short of that standard of perfection is missing the mark. Now, you might be satisfied with, being, with seeing some goodness in your life. But God is not. He's, he demands perfection. The Lord is quick to identify all forms of us trying to cheat the system, if you will. You can't get anything past God. And he doesn't allow you to draw your own targets, however much you might like to. In verse 7, we read, Isaiah said, there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself to take hold of you. The reason why people are, are refusing to take hold and receive their, self, their salvation is because they believe they are self-sufficient. And that their standard is really what matters. They don't, they distrust, I'll use my word, and they distrust God's word. They say, well, I can't be perfect. Therefore, God must not have meant that. I'm going to adapt the standard to be whatever it is that I want it to be. But we know, as Isaiah emphasized, that this ultimately leaves us separated from God. Now maybe you're thinking for just a moment, many of you probably know where I'm going with this, but otherwise you may feel, well, what, what do we do with this now? What are you saying? But this is by the grace of God and his plan that this perfect standard can be met. But it is not by us. It is through Jesus. And that it's only Jesus who can hit the target for us. In Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, Isaiah wrote, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Powerful, powerful prophetic words from Isaiah. He prophesied about Jesus' coming and how he would take away all of the sin in our world. And he received the punishment so that we could be healed and that we could be on target with God. Now, Ann Graham Lotz, be Billy Graham's daughter, he, she states that Isaiah understood that the root of the world's problems was sin. And he understood and believed that the solution was a Savior who would take away the sin of mankind and restore humanity to a right relationship with God. Can you imagine that in the, in the, first of all, in today's day, that would still be shocking. But in the day where Isaiah lived, where everyone around them believed that it was, and their old system was all about, their system was built on sacrificing, making daily sacrifices, and he's pointing to something incredible. And I want to just say here, in light of the fact that I've been talking about targets, that no pun intended, Isaiah was right on target with his understanding because God gave it to him. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he took that sin of us upon himself, all of our mistakes, all of our shortcomings. He took it all. The punishment that was, the, that was supposed to be ours was inflicted upon him. And so that we had a pathway to be at peace and to be reconciled with God. The divine wrath of God that is spoken about in scriptures was appeased, justice is satisfied, and peace was made. Now the word reconciliation describes exactly what Jesus did. Paul shared this in Colossians chapter 1. He wrote, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, him being Jesus, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Jesus paid the price so that we had the opportunity to be reconciled with God. The word reconcile that he wrote, the Greek word, means to bring back. As in it's recentering, realigning our lives with God, getting them back on target. Again, the wages of sin is death, but the good news, you know, that's the only part I read earlier, the, fo the follow-up here is, that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus offers us this indescribable gift. He removes the penalty, thereby granting us a perfect score, even though we have missed the mark countless times. One way I've heard this said, this is just something I've heard from someone else, there's no biblical basis per se in the way this is said, but the idea that was been expressed to me would be, you come before the Lord, you come before God when you die, but if you believe in Christ, it's as though Christ is standing between you and God. So even though you're standing there, what God sees projected to him is Christ's perfection. The Lord desires for each one here to hit that target and to spend eternity with you. In fact, Peter says that. He says, the Lord is not slow. How many of you have been saying, when will the end come? We see everything that's going on in this world and we're like, come Lord Jesus, come. And yet Peter says, the Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise, but he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His desire is for you to land on this target with him. Because at the same time, he is also targeting you. He's aiming straight at each person's heart in this world. He's stirring your conscience 
through the conviction of the Spirit. Because Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Can you, ask, can you hear Jesus asking to come into your heart, to be part of your life? Maybe for those of you, it brings back fond memories of that day when it, and that time when that did happen. He is chasing after you as hard as a hunter pursues that one that got away. Will you surrender your heart to him? And oh, providence. We talk about providence. What's the second song that I saw that they were going to do this, this morning? As the deer. And what was my closing verse? Psalm 42, verse 1. And so I pray, it is my hope, that if you have not come to a saving relationship with Christ, that he has worn you down enough so that you will feel like this. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you. And as I love to say, if you don't know Christ, today is the day of your salvation. Don't wait another moment. If you want to talk about that, if that message resonates with you and you don't have a relationship with Christ, please come talk to me after the service. I would love to pray with you and, and talk more. But let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we come before you knowing that we have all missed the mark, that even in a world that is, is grasping at straws and struggling to understand why the world is the way it is. Lord, we all understand that there's something not right. There's something that is just, that's fallen short, Lord, but yet you have given us the only answer that suffices, and it is that this, this uh, sin describes the, the brokenness and the separation and this, these, these emotions that are feeling, the things that we see going on in Afghanistan and all over the world, Lord, we, we, we think about the, the trials and, and tragedies of, of generations gone by and, and in our present day, where we know that underneath it all is the ugliness that is in man because of our sin. Lord, and because of this, and because of the fact that we cannot earn anything to, uh, in terms of gaining salvation by ourselves, Lord, I just ask that you overwhelm people here, embolden us in a way that says, Lord, we are in a very, very hurting world. They don't need to hear the message. Just pull it together and make it through as best as you can. They don't need to hear, you know what, it's just, just try harder next time. Or they need to hear that, yeah, we have all fallen short. And because we have fallen short, the wages of our sin is death. Lord, we all, we all deserve eternal separation from you. And yet you have of your grace and mercy given of your very Son to die for us. To, to, to come again, Lord, to save us and to offer us eternity to be reconciled with the Father. Lord, I pray that as we consider this week how you have spoken into our testimonies, Lord, as we think about writing them down and, and pray over them and ask God how we can uh, use them to best minister to people around us, Lord, help us always, always to focus the conversation on the cross. Lord, what you have done and what you have offered for each man, woman, and child that has ever been, is, and will ever be on this earth. Lord, we know that you are long-suffering and that you are patient, hoping and praying that not, you don't want anyone to not come to repentance. Lord, but we know even in your long-suffering, and in your long-suffering way, Lord, there is an end. Lord, there is a day when you will come back to this earth to divide the sheep and the goats. So, Lord, again, I echo, today is the day, Lord. I pray that you would stir in the hearts of those here that do not know you or 
that you would use people here to stir in the hearts of, of their loved ones, people they come into contact with regularly, to help stir the hearts of those who do not yet know you. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your providence. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and there will be one closing song. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God guide us. And may the love of God go with us on this day, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you.